So brake boosters 101, we're gonna start with the most common and most basic type, which is the vacuum booster. So first we're gonna discuss um, why we need it. First thing, I press on this brake pedal. These are actually um, piped in, so you can see I can make pretty, pretty minimal, maybe 100 PSI right there. All right, I can push. Even harder, that's it. So this pedal feels very firm. It's a hard pedal. Can't make a lot of pressure. Now what we could do, what the brake booster does, there's a diaphragm in here. So if we were to measure this, this is about like a 10 inch booster. So if you think about it, we're gonna actually apply a certain amount of uh, pressure here. With that amount of force, just my arm, I could probably make about 50 um, pounds. And then there's some leverage but then basically, we're gonna send that into the booster. And the booster, because it's a 10 inch booster, it's got a big 10 inch rubber diaphragm. It almost looks like a disc. Um, you can take these apart, but generally technicians don't. That'd be more like a specialty shop that would actually disassemble um, and rebuild a brake booster. But assume there's a, the big 10 inch disc in there. That's gonna be 10 square inches. And so if you think of pressure in PSI, right, I've put 50 pounds and then that's going to be going into this booster, but this booster has a 10-inch disc. If there was a way we could utilize that 10-inch disc, that could take our 50 and potentially make it into more like, you know, let's say 500 just for measurement's sake if it's a 10-inch disc. So we're multiplying our force because of the surface area of this booster. The bigger the booster, the bigger the disc, the diaphragm, the more PSI because we have more inches, more square inches. So the certain amount of pounds we put in become more and more square inches. But there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, this takes, like with everything in life, it takes power to make power. So. If we want to get this uh, increase from, let's say, 50 pounds to 500 pounds, um, we're going to use that disc, but what we need to do, we need to use vacuum. So in this trainer, this has a vacuum pump. This vacuum pump essentially becomes your engine. So we're going to take our engine and we're going to start it, and let's say this engine makes... Um, I don't know, 22 inches of mercury. We're gonna actually, through this hose, right, going all the way to here, send 20 inches of mercury and 20 inches of mercury. So that's sort of like um, negative PSI, you'd say. Maybe even for, for round numbers, let's make it uh, a negative 10 PSI, okay? So if we have negative 10 PSI and negative 10 PSI, that disc is doing nothing. But if we apply the pedal, what's actually going to happen, there's a valve in this booster, and that valve is going to open, and that's going to vent atmospheric air pressure into here. And technically, if you're at sea level, that's 14.7 uh, PSI. But for now, let's, you know, that would be absolute. If we just go with gauge pressure, so like, for example, I whip out this gauge, it reads zero. So let's go with gauge zero. I vent that to atmosphere. This ends up with zero PSI. This side ends up with negative 10 PSI. Now we have essentially 10 PSI pulling on 10 square inches of diaphragm. Now think about that. So we, we can take negative 10 PSI pulling on this and make it into 100 because it's 10 pounds per square inch but we have 10 square inches. So therefore, boom, right off the bat, we're at 100. And we haven't even really depressed the pedal yet. So if you think about it, we're doing two things when, when we push on this pedal. One, this pedal is pushing a push rod. And that push rod is going to push the master cylinder. We can do that right now. All right, and that's why we're getting some number there. You know, like that's about 50 pounds or so. But additionally, we can harness the power from our engine, make that negative 10 PSI, press this pedal, which really is also opening a valve. When we open that valve, atmospheric pressure will rush in. And that's why, like, with a car, for example, 
Um, when you step on the pedal, you can hear a little rush of air. Only when it's under vacuum, you can hear a rush of air. And that's literally the air rushing on the back side of the diaphragm, pushing the diaphragm effectively. And this side has vacuum on it, so it's pulling the diaphragm effectively. And that's what's going to actually bump our pressure up in our master cylinder. That's going to, this push rod comes in two parts. There's a push rod going in connected to the valve, and then there's a diaphragm connecting to a push rod that actually pushes the master. So as soon as we start applying that pressure, that diaphragm, that's actually going to really push hard on our master cylinder input piston. And a couple other familiarizations. So because this is an engine, in this case it's a vacuum pump, you have to think of your engine like a vacuum pump. If there's something wrong with your vacuum pump and your vacuum pump doesn't make the correct PSI, or, you know, in reality, we're going to measure it inches of mercury, right? It makes a suction. If there's something wrong, let's say we got worn pistons, worn rings, something up with our um, valve timing or something, we're not going to make as much, as much vacuum here. This isn't going to make as much force. If this doesn't make as much force, the pedal's going to be, feel hard. It's a hard pedal because it's not getting enough vacuum. So also look at this hose. If this hose is maybe, let's say, kinked, like right here, I'm gonna collapse, I'm gonna collapse this hose. If this hose is plugged off, the engine can make great vacuum, but the booster won't function correctly because it's not getting an adequate supply of vacuum. So those are the main things to consider. And then additionally, we do have a check valve here. And the check valve, people are commonly confused on what the check valve does. If I pull this check valve out, let's just say it's gonna be kind of nasty, but um Air should be able to come in here and out here, right? Because as you saw that, remember this hose is vacuuming. So it should be able to suck air out of that booster. But the second we turn our engine off, the engine's gonna fill with you know atmospheric pressure. It's gonna go through the intake, through the throttle body, into the head. You know, it the whole engine is gonna be backfilled with pressure. Well, all that positive atmospheric pressure would then go right into the booster. And then basically you'd have atmospheric and atmospheric, so you'd have no boost. That'd be the second the engine turns off. Think about that in a safety aspect. You're driving down the road, you get rear-ended, let's say, God forbid, by a tractor trailer. It hits you so hard your engine dies. You at least want to have several power stops. You know, at least two. Maybe three would be good, but at, but at least two. That's what this check valve does. So the second your engine dies and this check valve is installed, this check valve only allows air out. It only allows air to go this way. It won't allow atmospheric pressure to rush in and backfill the booster the second that your engine dies in that accident, right? So the first way I could test this, well, this is kind of janky. Because it's this, I should be able to suck on the small end where the hose was. Hear that? Okay, it works, but I shouldn't be able to blow through it. This check valve is good. My spit proves so. All right, so test one is called the function check. It tells us if the brake booster is working at all. I'll show you what that looks right here, and then we'll do it on the car. So right here, I pump the pedal. As you can see, well, you can't see, but the pedal's kind of hard to move. It's stiff. I'm not really building a lot of pressure. My brake booster's not doing anything. Obviously, it shouldn't be. I need to start the engine to make the vacuum to have it work. So I start it. Now, we should have vacuum on both sides of the diaphragm. Now, when I step on this, it should vent fresh air to this side of the diaphragm and give us a lot of assist. Right here, feels like a softer pedal. And as you can see, I'm up around 500 and 1,000 PSI. That's our function check. That's a pass. This next function check may be a fail. I'm gonna start the engine. And come over, feel the brake pedal. I'm not, it's, a hard, it's firm. I'm not making much pressure. It's a fail. If it fails, you need to verify if the booster is getting vacuum. And to do that, we use our vacuum gauge. 
I'm gonna pop pop this off the check valve and then I connect to the end of the hose and it says you can see the vacuum source should be here and it's gonna go into our gauge and start the engine we're not making any vacuum so if we're not making any vacuum we need to inspect our hose all right there's no vacuum here where am i losing it hmm. oh well that would do it so i found my hose was torn, ripped, disconnected, or whatever. Now let's recheck. I've repaired my vacuum leak. I restart. As you can see, now we've got some good vacuum. We should be about 17 inches of mercury here. So we're gonna make about 20. So with 20 inches of mercury, I should have good assist. You can see oh you know why I don't have good assist well it's because the vacuum's not hooked up it's being measured you can't measure it and it has to work at the same time so let's actually hook up the vacuum here there we go so now we're we're getting some really good assist so we've repaired this vacuum booster problem the whole time it was the vacuum hose. But it could be worse than that. All right, so this one you can see, it's the same setup. There's our booster right there. Let's do our function check. And as you'll recall, it's gonna be the same as what we did on the trainer. I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna pump the pedal, it's pretty firm. I'm gonna start it and it drops down. So that tells me my booster uh, function test is a pass on this. That means the brakes, power brakes are working. All right, new car. Just did my visual. We'll do one more function check. Now that you guys know what a good one looks like and a bad one looks like. Firm brake pedal, start it. What'd you think? My foot didn't drop. I got nothing. The pedal was hard. Pedal's still hard. That was a fail. This brake booster's not functioning. Now I want you to think, what would we do next? If you say that we should check the vacuum hose, good. Check it out. Vacuum hose is connected. Yes, I'll give you the clamp is slid back, but the vacuum hose is connected. Vacuum hose is connected back there. Hmm. Well, what do you think? We should measure the vacuum. So we'll get our vacuum gauge, or I like this one a little bit better. And I need to pull the hose off way back there to see if it's getting adequate vacuum all the way at the booster. All right, okay, right there. Gotta use the cone to attach to there. This is a legit test. Okay, here's our gauge. Obviously it doesn't have any vacuum right now. Start it up. This thing's making pretty decent vacuum. 15, 16 inches of mercury. And yet, no assist. Let me shut this off so I'm not running it too long. So let's discuss. The booster fails a function check, meaning it doesn't work. It could be because it doesn't have adequate vacuum. So I measured it and it's got adequate vacuum. So think of it like this. The booster has everything it needs to work, 
but it doesn't work. It's, it's kind of like an employee. You give an employee everything they need to do the job and they don't do the job, you need to get yourself a new employee. So this has a defective booster. That, that booster does not make any assist. No good. Now, the next one, I actually don't have a broken vehicle for, so I'm gonna talk you through it. Let's say we were to do the same test. Function test fails. I measure the vacuum. The vacuum is, let's say, somewhere near five or seven or 10. That would mean this engine is not building adequate vacuum. That could be piston rings, timing, uh, valve timing, hole in the piston, some kind of compression loss equals a vacuum loss. So that could actually be engine performance problem. So a, a brake problem could be an engine performance problem. All right, next test. This is one I gave you a little bit of a heads up on, but we're gonna talk about it more. It's called the air tightness check. So you normally wouldn't do the air tightness check until you've at least done the function check. If the function tests pass, you can uh, move on to this. So the air tightness check works like this. We're gonna start the engine, and it's gonna build vacuum right here. And then we're gonna shut the engine off, and then we're gonna wait three minutes. And after the three minutes, we're gonna come to this brake pedal, and we're gonna push it down. And we should still get about two pumps of assist, right? Unfortunately, right now, this is a hard pedal. So let's give it some vacuum. Ah. All right, there we go. We built up some vacuum. Kill the vacuum. We'd come over here. We'd wait three minutes. Three minutes is up. We should still have assist. Now, I hate to tell you, but this one doesn't. So that pedal should have dropped. Interesting. Will you remember something with this car? The first trainer, we heard a little leak. That test just failed. That means there's a leak somewhere. Where's the leak? Hard to say. Might have to do a little bit of uh, checking. So let's see if we can check. Run the vacuum, run the engine for a bit. Turn off and listen. That's the leak. That would have failed the air tightness check because it got a leak. So we would need to fix that. Is the customer ever gonna complain about that? No. Why is this test important? Well, in the unlikely event that the customer is driving their car and they're, God forbid, rear-ended by a huge tractor trailer, it hits them so hard the engine dies. If the engine dies, we need this to hold vacuum for at least you know, some amount of time so they can get a couple of assists. So let's try the test on this one. Because this is an actual vehicle. Right? I could do the function test, but we already know we fixed this function test, so I start it. I let it run for a bit. I shut it off. I wait three minutes. Three minutes later, ooh, I still have good assist. Two, but that was a little harder. By the time I get to three, that's a hard pedal. So this would be good if I was rear-ended and the engine died and I was knocked off the side of the road, I'd at least get two, maybe even three chances to, to get some good assist to get the vehicle safely stopped. That's the reason that we do this test to see is the system holding air. Even if the system's leaking, it'll still function, right? Bike on the trainer. This system is leaking, but it still functions. It still functions because the engine pumps enough air to make up for a small leak or even kind of a larger leak. So this one would still function, but it would pass the air tightness check. So if they were rear-ended and the engine died, when they go to hit the brakes, the brakes might immediately have no assist. It might not stop that well. So this is a safety concern that the customer is probably never going to complain about, but it's something that should be done you know, if we're, do, if we're diagnosing a brake pedal feel issue, this is a test that should be done.
Now let's check another one. All right, different vehicle. Well, technically I'm faulting and unfaulting the same one, but different vehicle, let's say, okay. I start it, run it for a minute. This is gonna build up vacuum. Another cool trick, well, I'll show you next. I shut it off. I wait three minutes. Immediately hard pedal. So this one failed the air tightness check for sure. And there's even another thing I can show you when I start this. Pedal dropped really nice. That's got the function check. When I shut it off, watch this. That's literally pushing my foot off the pedal. Let me show you that again. Dropped for the function check. Booster's working. Turn it off. It's literally forcing my foot up, even as hard as I hold. Well, let's discuss that. <clears throat> it's easier to see it right here. So think about this. When the engine runs, we do vacuum on this side of the diaphragm, vacuum on this side of the diaphragm. When I shut the engine off, this should hold air tightness, especially because the check valve. Now when my engine turns off, air is gonna come in the air intake, go in the throttle body, and backfill the whole uh, intake manifold with atmospheric pressure. That means atmospheric pressure is gonna go up this hose, and atmospheric pressure would be on this side, the diaphragm. That means it's gonna push my pedal that way, and that's exactly what I'm feeling. But see, it shouldn't do that. It shouldn't do that because this is a check valve. So again, let's go to two different check valves, right? What's in this one is in there. What's this one? This is a spare one I have, so let's... Tight. Good. It's a good check valve. That one, however, I suspect may be bad because remember, it's pushing my foot off the pedal. Let go, sweetheart. There we go. Check valve is defective. You already kind of knew that. And the reason I knew that was just really based on the symptom. Now, again, let's explain. We start it. We've got vacuum, vacuum. We turn it off, air fills the intake, air tries to rush up the hose, the check valve stops it, remember? Air should only leave the check valve, air shouldn't backfill the check valve. But in the case of this one, because that check valve is no good, we turn the engine off, atmospheric pressure comes through the intake, into the throttle body, in the intake manifold, goes down the intake into this hose, and it literally backfills this side of the booster, which is this side of the booster, and atmospheric pressure pushing and vacuum still being here. There you go. That's what's gonna push your pedal off. So this vehicle's clearly got a bad check valve. All right, so that's, those are your basic uh, tests for vacuum brake boosters. And here's one more thing you could do if you were worried about it, because boosters are expensive. You could actually hook this up and pump this entire booster to vacuum, but they got to be really airtight, and it's going to take a while with this. So this tool could actually tell you if this is defective too. But if you do those first steps, uh, the function test and the air tightness te test, just how I showed you, you'll be able to tell if it's a booster, a vacuum source issue, or a check valve. Now here's a cool vacuum booster note. This vacuum booster is a tandem. See how it's double deep? That's actually got two diaphragms to give us extra boost. And this was a Honda design, and I think they were concerned about, you know, the pilot was a big vehicle for them, so they wanted to make sure you had lots of vacuum assist to slow this girl down. 
and this has a very different style booster. This is a complete ABS master cylinder booster. It uses electric over hydraulic, so it uses an electric motor to make the assist. This one's really hard to see, but that's a totally different type. This one, because it's a hybrid, it'll also do regenerative braking, and that's gonna be a discussion for a little later. So another example of that. Obviously this is a, an EV, so we don't have an engine, so we don't have a brake, uh, vacuum booster, so it doesn't make sense to use any of the vacuum assist. This would be another example of the electric over hydraulic. And then being that it's a battery electric vehicle, it's also going to do that regenerative braking. We will cover more. So here's another type of booster, and this is on a Mustang. So on this one, if you can see, here's our master, and then there's all this mess in here. I'm like, what the heck is that? That doesn't look like a booster. Well, it's a booster, but it's a very different type. This is a Hydro Boost. So as we look, that booster just goes into this kind of strange looking thing with power steering lines, and this is an accumulator right here. So how this works, we're gonna use the power steering system. When we start the engine, that's gonna turn this power steering pump, which is way down here. Very tough to get the lighting good, right there. So when the engine starts and turns that serpentine belt, the power steering pump is gonna make a lot of hydraulic pressure. And most of the time, we're sending it down to the rack or the booster, or the rack or the box, I should say. So like on this one, you can see there's that power steering rack. So the rack is going to basically take the power steering pressure and either pump it to one side or the other side to help you turn the wheels. But it's going to not only go to the rack, it's going to go to the Hydro Boost. So one of these lines right here is going to have fluid going in. And that's going to provide this Hydro Boost with a whole bunch, hundreds of PSI of hydraulic pressure from power steering system. And when you step on the brakes, you're actually controlling a valve. And if you step on the brakes, it's going to use, it's going to open up a valve to use this, let's call this 600 PSI. We could, we could go, let's just call it five, even numbers. We're going to take 500 PSI potentially from the power steering system, and it's going to push the input piston of the master cylinder with tons of force. So as you can see, this has the potential to do just what a vacuum booster can do, but there's a key difference. It doesn't rely on the engine's pumping ability, it just relies on the engine ability to turn the belt to turn the power steering pump. So there's a couple reasons for that. To be quite honest, I really don't know why they put on the Mustang, but we're going to make this about another type of vehicle. Let's say that this was a turbocharged. Um, if we have a turbocharged car, you know, under boost, they don't make vacuum. So if they don't make vacuum, then they can't make, use a vacuum booster. So on a turbo car, you have good brakes while, you know, assuming that you're not coming off a wide open pull. If you were wide open and then you jam the brakes, you might not get vacuum right away. And if you don't have vacuum right away, then that means you don't have brake assist right away. So the vacuum booster is not real good for a turbocharged car or supercharged car, any car that makes boost, which is positive pressure in the intake because we need negative pressure vacuum in the intake. The other thing to consider is let's say it's a, a diesel. A diesel doesn't make vacuum at all. And I unfortunately don't have any diesels right here. Well, the big old RV looking thing. So if that was a diesel, the diesel engine is constantly pulling as much air as it possibly can. And we're controlling diesel RPM just by regulating fuel. So you put a vacuum gauge on a diesel, it's not gonna make any vacuum. So the Hydro Boost mainly would be for a turbocharged, supercharged application or diesel. Then there's a few exceptions. So if you had a vehicle that was a gas, but it was going to be working pretty hard, like as a tow truck or something, a heavy duty truck, let's say it was uh, 
This is a GMC Sierra 1500, but let's say this was a 2500 HD with a gas, like a 6 liter, a 6.2, or a 6.6 or something. That would be a perfect vehicle for a Hydro Boost because if you're going to be towing a lot, you're going to be under a lot of wide open throttle. Now, something that's hard to understand about engines is at idle, you make good vacuum. But if you're like closer to wide open throttle, your throttle plates open this engine is not going to build a lot of vacuum. The engine is going to be allowed to pull as much air as it wants, so therefore there's not going to be a lot of suction right there. So you'll see a hydro boost on a lot of heavy-duty vehicles as well, even if they're gas. Now, a little bit more about the hydro boost. Let's say you rolled up to this particular vehicle. You jumped in it, and the steering wheel was stiff, and the brake pedal was firm. Those two are related. Remember, it uses power steering to not only steer with assist, it also uses it for the brake assist. So the second you got a hard pedal and a firm steering wheel, you're gonna to wanna to come out here and at a minimum, let's say you check the fluid level and the fluid level's low, you're gonna to wanna to fill it, you know, and then see if they both return to functioning and then you would, you know, diagnose the leak. Or another thing, what if there's something wrong with this belt. What if this belt is broken? If it's completely broken, you'll have no brake assist and no power steering assist. What if this belt is loose? What if this belt is slipping? What if this belt is oil soaked and slipping? What if it has a bad belt tensioner and it's not maintaining enough pressure? There's, there's a number of different symptoms that would cause loss of steering assist and loss of brake assist. And so these are all really good ASC concepts. They can ask the same concept 10 different ways. But if you really understand it, you don't have to memorize anything. You just have to know how the system works. So let's say the wording was, a vehicle comes in for stiff steering and a firm brake pedal. You better be all over the fluid, the hoses, uh, the the fluid sorry the fluid the belts but also consider a bad power steering pump itself would cause it so if the fluid's good and the belt's not slipping there's pretty good evidence that it's not making psi that's probably going to be a bad pump if you wanted a that's enough for the ASC if you wanted a hundred percent diagnosis you'd actually have to undo one of those lines and put a gauge on it and measure how many psi of power steering pressure you're making now let's say it was slightly different. Let's say that the vehicle came in with a firm brake pedal, but the power steering was fine. You're not going to find a bad pump, right? A pump would cause both. A belt would cause both. Fluid would cause both. A tensioner would cause both. But if the power steering is working and the brake pedal stiff, I'd be more looking at this Hydro Boost. At a minimum, the Hydro Boost, you know, could have an internal problem. I don't even know that it's really possible to have a problem with, with one of the hoses because they all circulate. The hose comes in and the hose goes out. So if there was a problem with one of those hoses, I think it would affect both. Um, but you could at least um, narrow it down some more. Now, if you had a good brake pedal but a hard power steering, you'd probably be more looking at the rack, right? So the pump affects both. The booster, the, the hydro boost affects the brakes. The rack affects just the steering. Right, and then let's even go a step further. Let's say like I had explained with that vacuum booster car, if you get rear-ended and the engine dies, you no longer have brake assist. Well, on the vacuum car, we had the check valve and the size of the reservoir is the booster, so you have at least a couple pumps. With this, we do a little different. That's the purpose of this thing we were looking at earlier. This is the accumulator. We store pressurized fluid, hydraulic fluid, which is power steering fluid in there. And that can be good for like 20 pumps. So assuming that uh, the accumulator is working correctly, this vehicle can die and you'll still have like up to 20 pumps. Now, if you're gonna work on one of these, that's why we have to pump the brake pedal. Sometimes we'll say like 30 or even 40 times because that's gonna discharge the pressure here. If you never pumped it, right? If you started it, ran it, shut it down, and you start popping these lines off and trying to work on this uh, booster, this uh, hydro boost, especially internally, that is still charged. So that's why we need to actually pump the pedal a certain number of times to 
discharge it. Um, and then as you can see, this one's all covered in, in goop and oil. So the main, the main failure point with these, to be quite honest, is leaks. So the leak at the input seal back here, the leak at the accumulator, the leak at the output seal that goes to the master cylinder. Mainly, that's what you need to know on the hydro boost system. All right, now that uh, electric booster, we may say, um, this one happens to be hybrid, but we're just going to focus on the electric aspect of the booster. Basically, you're going to step on the brake pedal. I'm going to very simplify this versus a Prius is a little more complex. So let's say this is a non-hybrid with uh, electric over hydraulic. You step on the brake pedal, you're actually sending a signal to this, uh, we'll call it the electronic booster. And that electronic booster, first off, if it's non-functional, it, you'll just simply push through to the master cylinder. And the master cylinder will still apply the brakes. In fact, this bolt shows it a little bit better. I mean, if you look, that master cylinder is still in line with the booster. So let's just say all power failure is lost. You're still pressing on the electric booster, and the electric booster has a piston that's going to press on that master. Right? It's still going to work. But the booster is not going to offer you the assist. So if you step on the pedal, yes, you're applying the master cylinder, but you're also, uh, you're also applying a specified amount of pressure and or stroke distance. It's this computer right here, that could be a couple different names, but let's just say, let's just call it the, the um, I was going to say EBCM, electronic brake booster. Um, yeah, we'll just say computer, okay? Skid control ECU. Let's go with the computer. This, this computer is monitoring sensors. So when it sees how far you've stroked the pedal and with how much force, it's going to run some algorithm that's programmed into it from the factory. And it's going to say, okay, let's provide 500 PSI equivalent of assist. And basically what it's going to use, there's a pump that's run by a motor. It's going to spin the motor high speed and it's going to actually build 500 PSI of brake pressure, and that's actually going to really apply the brakes. So the master cylinder is there, but really this pumping and then opening of the valves to the four wheels it's, is what's going to apply the brakes. So we do have a master cylinder, but this electronic brake booster essentially becomes the master cylinder and the brake booster as an entire assembly. So your master cylinder is there mainly, realistically, as a backup. Primarily, you'll see we're just going to send the brake fluid pressure right from this booster. Um, so we'll go. We'll jump back over the Prius now that you understand the basic functions. Alrighty. So as you can see, this one is, is even a little bit more complex. It's got a reservoir here, and that reservoir is going to feed that pump, and that pump is going to be connected to the four lines and then like I had said this which is a different computer is going to actually control the pump and the valves so you hit the brake runs the pump we will pull the fluid as necessary we will send it to all four wheels and then let's say um, for whatever reason you wanted a thousand psi up here and 500 back there no problem this can do all that type of stuff so it's not only acting as a brake booster, it's effectively the master cylinder and it's going to do a lot of your proportioning front to rear. Um, it's going to work with your ABS. Some of these wires would be your wheel speed. So ABS would be covered a little bit more in detail later, but it's hard to at least not touch onto ABS lightly because this electronic booster is absolutely integrated with ABS. So no vacuum, it just uses power, voltage, to run the motor. Now this isn't anything hybrid at all. There's no high voltage that goes to that system. That system can be found on a forerunner, um, a four-wheel drive Tacoma, some of them. Um, all, sorts of, all sorts of stuff will use that booster, especially quite a few of the Lexus models will just use the whole assembly. The negative is if you have a bad master cylinder, you need the assembly. 
If the motor goes bad, you need the assembly. If the computer goes bad, you need the assembly. And last one we got was about 3,800 bucks. And that was not retail cost. So now probably, probably the most complex, but um, I can give it to you pretty simplified would be um, discussing regenerative braking. And this is, this is something that should really be covered on its own, but just to make sure you understand this vehicle won't really need all that much braking power because we can do regenerative braking um, effectively through the wheels. There's no components, there's no extra caliper, there's not a hose or anything different. Really, what we're doing, because it's integrated with this electronic booster, we're pushing on the brake pedal. We can push on this brake pedal and we could build hundreds of PSI. But if ultimately the valves and the electronic booster are closed, none of that fluid is actually applying the calipers. So there's no assist there. It's no nothing, in fact. It, it literally won't even squeeze the calipers. But it will generate, you know, uh, basically an idea of what the customer wants. If they're jamming the brake pedal hard and they're stroking it near the floor, that means they want a lot of braking. This computer will send a signal to various parts of the hybrid system, which will ultimately work through the inverter, which will ultimately work through the transaxle, where we have MG1 and MG2 under there. I can show you that a little better over here. So this is MG2. This is the main drive motor for the wheels. And essentially, this part is fixed. So this makes it the stator. The rotor is gonna be spinning in here. What I want you to picture is each of these segments. If we have, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna try to skip three phase, but I can't really totally explain this without at least a little bit of three phase. If you look, there's UV and W phases here. We have our rotor that's gonna be spinning. And let's just say we have one uh, part of the rotor that's being drawn towards the U phase right here. We're gonna have the U phase effectively a little bit ahead of the spinning rotor. This is a U, this is a U, this is a U. It's every third, right? U. Skip, skip, U. So those U phases are gonna be triggered at a little bit of a faster rate. So let's just say that our rotor was spinning at 59 RPMs. Our frequency is gonna be pulling it towards 60. As long as our U's are changing over at a speed that's equivalent to 60 RPMs, it's gonna be pulling the rotor along. Make sense? Now, of course, it's doing that in three different phases. So it's going to be the U's going to be hitting, the V's are going to be hitting, the W's are going to be hitting. It's all going to be pulling that rotor. Now, let's switch that up. Let's just say that that's to accelerate, right? We're going to have the we're going to have these cycling faster than the actual rotor moves. Let's just switch it up. The customer applies the brake, or better yet, they even use the B mode. They pull this over and down. That puts it in regenerative braking demand. Well, what we can do, your, because your rotor is already spinning at, let's say, 59, we'll start to make this frequency 55, right? So now your rotor is kind of ahead. Your rotor is going faster, and we're triggering the use behind the rotor. And then basically you have the rotor that's we're actually trying to slow it down with the magnetic field. And the byproduct is going to be it's going to generate current rather than use current. So what you have to consider is all that braking is really occurring with the inverter. The inverter controls the three phases to MG2. So it's going to basically make these at 61 RPMs or at 55 RPMs or at 52 RPMs or at 59. So a lot of that braking sensation is originating here at the inverter and that's either pulling our rotor along or it's kind of dragging our rotor back. You know, the rotor's still spinning forward, but it's spinning forward because let's say we're at the top of a hill, we're going down, that rotor's whipping, but the frequency is behind schedule essentially, which is slowing it. And you can feel how it slows the wheels down. So when you apply the brakes on this car, you may not even build one PSI hydraulic pressure at all. 
You will, however, trigger the frequency to be slowed down, and that is regenerative braking, mainly because the byproduct is that electricity is put into the inverter, the inverter inverts it to DC and sends it back to that battery. So those are all the types, all the types of brake boosters and at least a little bit of troubleshooting on each of them. Troubleshooting on this one is a lot less mechanical and a lot less electronic. So if you have a problem with this, A, yes, these master cylinders can go bad. Uh, the diagnosis, you know, is kind of similar to, you know, you'd have to put some plugs in there and see if you can get a firm pedal. The bleeding procedure on this is different, but, but basically the booster part, there's no mechanical check. There's no vacuum gauge. There's no pressure. There's just, it sets a DTC or it doesn't set a DTC. So if you got a problem with this type of brake booster, you're essentially doing diagnostic trouble code diagnosis. If for some reason it doesn't work at all, think of it like this. It's basically a computer and a motor. If the motor doesn't work, you're going to get a code for the motor, motor circuit or motor performance. The motor needs 12 volts and ground. So there's a fuse for the motor. There's something that's controlling the motor. So that would be this computer here. If let's say that that computer won't communicate in the network, well, we don't diagnose these computers really any different than any computer. So it's a whole bunch of computers over there. If I log on to this network on my computer and I can communicate with 19 of those computers, but I can't communicate with one, there's something wrong with that computer. It's not that the whole network is down. So generally this isn't network diagnosis. This is, you know, one module not communicating. Well, what's a computer need to communicate on the network? It needs 12 volts and ground. It needs the power, right? It needs to be powered up and it needs a connection to the network. So. Over here, we're going to have probably a, at least a couple different power sources of positive, and we're going to have at least a ground or maybe more. Then we're going to have two wires, can high and can low. So if you really needed to troubleshoot this, you, you know, that would be if it had a loss of communication. So you're either following a diagnostic trouble code set in this module, or you're getting a loss of communication, and let's say the ECM lost communication with the skid control ECU then you're doing like very basic network diagnosis, but it's really just, you just find out why that one computer's not on. So not a real big deal. Um, a little bit to take all at once, but that's the overall brake booster 101.